Okay, so at this point, if you manage to create the account, I still left it at this screen here. You might have proceeded, but this is just telling me that now I've got a Google My Business. I've got a Google page for my business, which will allow me to build a brand audience and all of that good stuff. Get reviews, reply to reviews, etc. There's a tour which I'm going to skip, so if you've already skipped it, that's fine. I'm going to click Skip Tour. And then that takes you to this screen where I can see my profile. This is going to be your, your, your front-facing view of your, of your company. When someone searches tech reviews, and if my company appears on a Google search, um, whatever I have here is what people are going to see. So this is my first chance to make that first impression. So there's an edit button. When you see the edit button, go ahead and click on it. You might get a pop-up about the new Google. You want to say, let's go. You do want to select the new Google because eventually the old Google will be phased out. You might as well use the new one. If you do no thanks, it'll keep the, the old one. Um, but I'm going to say the, I'm going to click let's go, the new one. Um, you'll always have the opportunity to, to link back to it right there, back to classic Google+. But it's not going to be always available to you. So, at the top left there's an arrow to go back. I'm going to click the arrow there. Okay, so on the left then we have a variety of links, and one of them is the profile link. And that again, unfortunately, is this odd terminology in which I earlier had said personal accounts are profiles and business ones are pages. So it's going to still list it perhaps as profile here, even though at the top right corner it is telling me it's a page. That's a bit confusing, but I'm just confirming that I'm on the right account at the top right corner. I'm using my current Google Plus page. Anyway, on profile, at the left, which is your page, I have the ability here to edit the profile. So here is where I can set uh, information about my account that stands out, because right now I just have this basic graphic that every Google Plus account gets. One of the ways that you get followers and traffic and such is to have a fully set up brand. People are going to trust an account less that looks like the generic bland one that everyone gets. And this is part of your marketing and your, and your advertising and such. This is the, um, the spot for you to put in a background graphic that catches the attention. Maybe it's a photo of your products. There's also a spot to put an icon for your logo. So these are two things that you should edit, and you can simply click the, the, the little uh, picture icon and you'll upload a photo. I don't have any photos of my business at the moment, but you would edit those graphics to customize. There is a spot for a tagline. And it says it's 140 characters. So you've got the space here, 140 characters. This is not words, this is characters, which includes spaces, punctuation, symbols, and such. You have 140 characters to write something about your business, which helps you when people search. I'm not going to use this spot to, to just fill it with keywords such as tech, review, San Diego, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to use it like that. I'm going to use it as a real sentence because the search engines, as they get more sophisticated, they 
change the way they work, they change the way they rank you, and the current algorithm, the current technique that the search engines rank you by is to be the most natural that you can. Not that you're stuffing 10 keywords here, that you have a real sentence that explains what your business is about so that the search engine can understand your keywords, but also the people searching for you. So an old way to optimize would just to be put, put keywords. That's the old way. It's not so good anymore. You want to write real, human-readable sentences. So my business's name, Victor's Tech Reviews, is pretty self-explanatory. Therefore, I can write a tagline that, that is useful to me there in that regard. But if I had a business that, was, that had a, a, a name like, what does that even mean? What does PMD Interactive mean? What do they do? Then definitely I'm going to use my tagline to explain. So if, if I had the PMD Interactive, I would write um, web marketing and uh, design. Founded in San Diego. So I'm still putting those keywords, San Diego, web design, marketing, but I'm putting them in a way that is a complete sentence. And I still have about a hundred characters that I could still write, which I would. I would try to use as many characters as possible there to write a sentence or two or so that explains what your business is. Especially if your business has a has an esoteric name, a name that not everyone knows what it means. Victor's Tech Reviews is pretty self-explanatory, but I'm still going to do it like this, perhaps. Unbiased Tech Reviews or Technology Reviews ranging from mobile devices to desktops and everything in between. And I still have about 50 characters that I could write. So I'm writing some sentences, a sentence or two, that really explains what the business is. Yes. I would request another one, yes. Uh, those ver verifications only last a little while, and so if it already expired, perhaps, then it's not valid. So I would just request another. I made a change here, so I'm going to click Save. And so if I added my picture and so forth, then I um, can further customize my account so that I can more easily be found. One of the things that I noticed that I think is a little annoying with the new Google is that it opens a lot of tabs. At the very top, I haven't quite been paying attention, but now I've got all these tabs up here. Um, at the very least, I had a tab, which is still open, Google My Business. And when I clicked to edit, it took me to, to the business. So be careful, <coughs> careful about this. You might have a couple different tabs open. Um, and so... It could be, so at the moment all that we could do perhaps is just uh, follow along and then it'll, it'll work better later. So I've got my page here and I've got a little editing that I did. I'm going to click at the left the home button. Under the home button is where you would see the content of the accounts that you're connected to. The whole point for businesses 
of any social network is a form of marketing. If, uh, if a company sends out flyers to everyone in my neighborhood, some of those people are going to take that flyer and use the coupon, let's say. And some people, like me for example, I'm just going to put it in the recycle bin. I'm not even going to look at it. I don't care. But that company spent hundreds, if not thousands, even hundreds of thousands, of dollars to, to create that flyer, to have someone design the graphics for it, write the text, um, print it out, ship it, and then deliver it. All of that expense for the result of some people following through and using the coupon and some people throwing it away. That's the concept of return on investment. What did you get as a return on what you invested? If a company spent a thousand dollars to put out these flyers and half of them were used and half of them not, that might be a good return on investment. Better would be obviously 75 percent of them were used and 25% were not. But realistically, it's often the opposite. 25% or less get used, and 75% get thrown away. What do you think the return on investment is on that billboard that you pass every day? You are never going to follow through on that billboard. So the return on investment on you is very low. You never returned on how much they invested on that billboard. But some amount of people will look at that billboard and actually buy the product or hire the person or whatever. I say that because those are real world aspects of marketing. It's advertising, it's getting your name out there, getting visibility for yourself in the real world. The digital world is the same thing, but it's just digital. Digital marketing, web marketing. I'm going to create a Google Plus account, a Twitter account, an Instagram account, and I'm going to put posts and tweets and photos and I'm going to get followers, and I have 500 followers. But that doesn't mean all those 500 followers are then going to click buy. Probably very low amount, 1%, which rounds down to about, you know, one to five people. Out of 500 people, really followed through. So that's why, via social media, we want to get followers. The more followers we have on Twitter or Google+, or Facebook or whatever network, if we distill it down to 1% of actually caring and being active, the number is very low. That's why you want more and more followers. But you don't get followers automatically. I'll be talking about a couple of ways to get followers. Because right now, on our home screen, we're going to start to, on our path to get followers, the home screen is going to be stuff that people are are posting. You're going to see pictures and links and video and whatever. I never made a connection to any of these people. Johnny, Sergeant, Vivo, I never made any connection to them, but this is showing me trending, trending content so that I don't have an empty experience in Google+. Plus, It automatically shows me some content. But as I use Google+, Plus, then it will actually hone in on the important stuff. So I've got this tech uh, account, and I want to see tech stuff. And it's not quite showing me tech stuff, because I haven't used it enough to, to understand what I care about. Communities, we, we, we can choose, like, which side that... Yeah, we're going to get to communities. It's one of the important aspects, definitely. That we, that we get to pick and then it's going to show up on your home. Yeah. Just right now, it's like... It's, yeah. it's kind of random, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get to communities in a moment. But here what we want to do is, if we, if we look at some of these examples, let's say Sport Auto Live, let's say I... That's a, that's a cool post, or maybe over here, Victor <coughs> Elizarov posted this. We can tell what is useful or interesting or popular because the posts have these numbers at the bottom. This picture, for example, this is Zion National Park in, in Utah. 
and it's got it says plus one nineteen. It's got this symbol here three. Plus one is like if you were on Facebook, you get a like. You posted a picture that someone enjoyed on Facebook, they click like, thumbs up. On Twitter, it has it has a heart. That's the like, that's the favorite. They have different terms. On Google Plus, they call it a plus one, which is a like. You enjoyed this, you clicked plus one, you liked it. So as an example, I'm gonna click it, it becomes red, and now it became 20. 20 people plus one did. 20 people liked it. Let's see over here, country and Irish. That one's got 17, that one's got three. This one over here, this one's 103. People love that picture, and it's got 10. That symbol right there is the, is the share symbol. That means that this picture was spread out to more people. Let's say I have three followers. If I post a picture, you might think, well, only three people are going to see it. I have three followers. Actually, 300 people could see it. 3,000 people could see it. Because if someone shares my picture, that means that my picture is being copied and shared to the connections of my connections. So if one of my followers has 1,000 followers, my picture went from me to that person to their 1,000 followers, potentially. So shares are pretty valuable. This one went to 10, and that's why it's built up 103 plus ones, perhaps. This one here, people love uh, animals. So this one's got 73 plus ones, and it's got five shares. It's been spreading out to more people. And it's also got this symbol here, comments. We see the comments cycling through right here. People are have commented on this. There's been eight comments. These three things are the interactions that every social network has to some degree. On Facebook, if I enjoyed something, I click thumbs up. There's a like. If I uh, liked it enough to share it, I can share it. If I like it enough to comment, I can comment. Twitter has that. Google Plus has that. Facebook has that. Instagram has that. Every network has a variation on those three interactions. And that's what I want. That's what I'm always looking for on my social media endeavors. I want to post content that gets me those three interactions. The importance, I would say, goes from left to right. Number one is the least important, I mean the plus one is the least important, the comment is second most important, the share is most important. Not that this one is worthless, not that the plus one is worthless, it still has a value, it shows you if people care. It's not the worst thing a person can do, the worst thing is do nothing, totally ignore you. See the picture, don't care, and move on. I'm just saying that it's very easy to plus one that, looks nice, move on, what's next? Plus one that one, nice, move on, what's next? Plus one is very disposable. It is some measure about your success, about what you're doing on social media, but it's very disposable. These two are a little better because the comment, hopefully someone is writing something interesting, keeping the conversation going, adding something to the conversation, to the photo, and that and popularity breeds popularity. Something that has activity will get more activity. That's, that's how you go viral. That's how something reaches a lot of people and makes you famous, perhaps. So, the, um, yes, question? So, at this point, I, I kind of, I missed a little bit of this. The, that plus one is for people that come to your site and they like it? Or is that something that you do to like? Uh, uh, in this case right now, I liked that photo. But when I post something, people will like my stuff. Okay. People will like my stuff or comment on my stuff or share my stuff. And that's what I can do too. I can like someone's stuff. I can plus one someone's stuff. I can comment on it. I can share it. I want all of those as well on my stuff through my followers. So we'll talk about getting followers. But then the third level, the, higher, the highest level I would say, is a share because then that is spreading my content to more people that is potentially getting me more exposure. Um, 
and if more people see my content because of that share, they could potentially plus one it, comment it, or actually the highest level of all is a follow. A follow is that I'm seeing Aisha's posts. I'm really liking them. I can go to any profile and I'll see follow. That's the highest level because that means you're building an audience. You're building people that care about your content. And the more followers you have, the better in terms of reaching an audience. Again, if I have five, see, Aisha right here has 23,000 and a half followers. That's, it's probably not a little kid posting. It's probably her daughter. Because you have to be at least 13 years old to use Google+. Plus. But Aisha has 23,000 followers. What's 1% of 23,000? It's like uh, 23 or so. And then you take away a, you take away a digit or so, 23, 24. So about, so less than 30 people that could be very um, ready to buy your product, to subscribe to you. That might be a very conservative number, 1%. Maybe you have an audience that is 50% of your people really will care. That, that'd be amazing if you have 100 followers and 50 of them are ready to buy. More accurately, usually, it's you're going to have 50 followers and maybe two are ready to buy. Maybe one, maybe five. 1%. That's why you want to get as many followers as possible. That's obviously easier said than done. But this trending is a bit of a of an education. What are people looking at? What are people liking and plus wanting and commenting on? Can I create something like that? Can I share something like that? Can I get a, a, a panther to sit still so I can take a photo of it? Probably not, but my cat is close enough. <laughs> so if I can share content that people care about, like this, this is a nice photo. I could probably take a similar kind of photo. 268 plus one, that's 17 comments. And so it's about the content. That's how you get followers. Neil Howard must have a lot of followers. That's a cool photo. Victor over here has a cool photo. And look at that. It's really cool. So probably over here, uh, Gossam has one too. So it's your content. What are you posting? This is not the most amazing photo. This is, a, I think, a technically more interesting looking photo. But probably a lot of people still like that photo. And so you're going to be sharing on Google+, on Twitter, on Facebook, on any social network you have. You're going to be sharing content that people care about, people like, that they will then follow you for. So when we have a brand new account, like we all do right now, we don't have followers. We don't have an audience. What's 1% of zero? Zero. We are not going to get any interactions, any likes, any comments, any follows, any traffic. So we're going to talk about building followers. The reason you want followers is not only to stroke your ego, but to have a potential audience to buy your product, or subscribe to your newsletter, or donate to your nonprofit, or whatever you're trying to do online. And so. we have to come to a realization that okay i need followers so i'm going to i'm going to follow people one aspect one way to get followers is for you to follow you might follow sport auto live and they might follow you back you might follow victor he might follow you back so one tactic is simply to go to different accounts so if you can try this on anything that you see here click the profile and then there's a follow Okay, got it. I follow them. Perhaps Victor will follow me back. Perhaps not. Maybe over here, Jeffrey. What if I click on on Jeffrey's account? I'll click on Jeffrey. Follow. This isn't following. At the follow the people that have a lot of followers. 
That's one possible tactic, yes. Follow people that have a lot of followers, because if they, if that person cared enough to follow that other person, they might follow you too. Whenever I click follow on anyone, uh, everyone has the same kind of Google+, and everyone will see a little bell up here. This is the notifications. This is what tells you, you have a new follower, you have a new comment, etc. So when I click follow on these two accounts, their little bell here changed. It increased. It, it, it tells them a new notification. I don't have any yet. If you click on the bell, it, it will say, there's nothing going on. You're all cut up. No, no, nothing new. But as you get active and start following accounts, you will get a notification item up there, and it'll say 1 or 2 or 10 or 90 or whatever. Activity. People know about you now. Because you've just created this network, no one knows about you. So following accounts will, will then alert people to your presence so that they can follow you back. And now, as I'm following accounts, now here it's starting to show the content of those that I follow. It's not showing me as many of the trending ones because now I've chosen to follow Jeffrey, so I'm seeing his stuff. Like that, I like it. Plus one. He got a notification that said, Victor's Tech plus one your post. And so, this is one tactic. Follow accounts. I think there's a limit. I'm not sure what it is, but it's probably like 500, at, 500 per day or something. I don't know what it is, but to just follow, 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 follow will get you some results. Again, it's going to be, to some degree, a numbers game in that if I followed 10 accounts, maybe one will follow me back. If I followed 100 accounts, maybe... 40 will follow me back. It doesn't always apply one-to-one. -one. Every time you follow an account does not mean you will get a follow back. It's a little different than Facebook, where you put a friend request, both of you agree, and you're connected. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Twitter and Google Plus and other networks are a one-to-many relationship, in that I can choose to follow many accounts, but they don't necessarily need to follow me back. It's not a requirement. I can have many followers, but I don't have to follow them back. And so the, um, the numbers game of following a lot of accounts will only take you so far. That might not be the most effective. Because I follow Jeffrey because it looks like he's got a lot of interesting things he's posted. I haven't posted anything. Why would then an another account choose to follow me if I don't have anything interesting to say. I haven't shared anything. So before I tried to go in to start to follow, 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 actually is what I was going to say a moment ago. The realization is I don't have anything to offer people to follow me. Why would they care to follow me? So we get this conundrum. Am I going to try to get followers first? Or am I going to post content first? But if I post content first, I don't have any followers, so no one sees it. So I need followers. But I can't get followers because I don't have any content. You see the conundrum. I'm going to say to break the conundrum, to break the loop, is you're going to post stuff first. Yes, you have no followers. No one's paying attention. It's like you're going to be talking to yourself. But you're going to be posting stuff so that when then you change, you go to the phase of getting followers, you have something to show for it. Something for people to actually follow you for. So don't, t don't spend too much time right now on doing a lot of follows yet. I don't have anything to, to show to people. So let's do that first. I'm going to... If you go... if you click on home, you go back to home. You'll, I think you'll always see it. You'll always see this pencil on the bottom right. But if you, you might also see it 
differently like this, what's new, that's to post something, or you might see a pencil. So there's always a way to share something. And you can share different things, as we'll see. So my goal, my recommendation, and what I do for real clients when they start off on any social network, is I tell them, you want to share three to five to ten posts um, before you try to get followers. And posts can include pictures, links, locations, and other such things. And so I'm going to craft my first post here. I'm Victor's Tech. I've clicked what's new, and I'm going to write here. Just got on Google+. Plus. Well, that's actually... who cares? That's a kind of a post, that's a navel-gazing post, that's... who cares? Why would, why would that be important enough for someone to follow? So, when you post anything on any social network, you want to think in terms of, why would people care? Is it interesting? Is it funny? Is it useful? Is it... Uh, does it educate? So, something like this I wouldn't post. It's, it's a waste of time and effort. No one's going to follow you because of that. You're going to think in terms like this. Just go on Google Plus. Follow me for exclusive reviews on tech products and discounts. You won't find anywhere else. So something a bit more that stands out like that. So hashtags are um, something that you can use. They didn't seem to take off as much like in Twitter. Uh, hashtags are really strong on Twitter. They're also available on Google+, but they didn't really seem to take off. Hashtags also are on Facebook. Does anyone know, did anyone know that? You can put hashtags on Facebook. Uh, no one really knew that and used it, so they're not that useful on Facebook. For Google+, Plus, um, they're, they're useful, so you can put in hashtags, but they're much more powerful on Twitter. So notice this kind of post that I'm writing. This is, this is the kind of post that's what's in it for me, you know, a, a potential customer. If someone sees this, then they have much more of a reason to care than simply just got on Google+. Well, now I'm saying what's in it for you, which is follow me for exclusive reviews on tech products and discounts you won't find anywhere else. So always think in terms of posting stuff that people would care about, entice people. I can write some text and I can attach a picture. The little icon there is for a picture. I don't have any pictures handy, but I'd be able to upload a picture and attach it. I can also attach a link. I click the little link there and I add a link. What's useful about that is that it will create a link, it will create a preview of whatever website you're linking to. So if I added a link to my blog, for example, I'm going to add a link. What Google will do is it will look at that link and it will create a thumbnail and a, and a synopsis of it. And switch your picture thumbnail there. But let's say here, let me back up, let's say I wrote this and I add the link to my website. And I add that link that I'm talking about. I'm 
when when you add a link, I mean, I, I, I saw the the dot three dot things, and they can edit the comment, but I'm not seeing. Uh, no, the link is going to be down here on the on the chain. If you went back to edit a post, I don't think it's going to show up. So you have to do it on a new post. So let's say I'm just going to be basic and I'm going to add some text, but I could add pictures, links, or location. Location won't work very well on a regular computer because location really is tied to GPS and our computers don't have GPS. So if you get the Google Plus app for your phone or tablet, you can share and then you can attach a location. The reason we might want a location is let's say I have a shop on Main Street and I'm writing here sale this Saturday 10% off in store and I attach a location that'll attach a map to my post so when someone is looking at it on the desktop or mobile better yet on mobile they will see a map and if they want to go to my shop they will have the ability to click the map to get directions so that might be a reason to to add a location At the moment before I post this, it's also saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to post something, and I'm going to post it public. I'm going to post it to everyone in the world. Well, everyone on Google+. Anyone that, that finds my profile or searches these keywords might find my post. I've set it to public. But I've also got other options. If I click on public, it pops up circles we'll talk about circles in a moment but circles are the way that you organize your connections we'll see how we do that but I've connected with I've followed Jeffrey and Victor so this that I'm about to share I can say only Jeffrey and Victor can see this because I have followed a couple of people only they too can see it this is like sending in a sense sort of like uh, private messages but I'm posting on Google Plus only they will be able to see it when we get to this in a moment I can organize people into what they call circles which are just like kinda like folders I can put I have these circles built in your circles customers VIPs team members let's say I created a circle called tech people and another circle called artists so in this other screen that we'll show later I can put Jeffrey into the tech circle and Victor into the art circle and I can add as many people as I want to the different circles so then when I share something I'm gonna say only share it with the art people only share it with the tech people or share it with tech people and art people I can add circles as many as I want. Public is no one in particular, so everyone could see it. If I select the circle, then only the people that I've chosen will see it. And so uh, I give this example of a store. I've got a pet shop, let's say, and I have people that I've connected with. And some of those people are dog lovers, and some of those people are cat lovers, and some of them are reptile lovers. 
So I can put each of these people into their own circle, into their own way to organize them. So when I post a coupon, 10% off reptile food, only the reptile people will care, not the dog people, not the cat people. So we'll, we'll see how to create circles in a moment, but that's the big reason why we would use circles, to target our content to the people that really care. I'm going to leave it as simply public. And finally, I will post. So I posted this, and now all zero of my followers would see this. But that's okay, because as I said, we want to post three to five to ten things to no one in particular, so that then when I start to follow accounts, and they click on my account to check me out, and they see he's posting stuff I like. That business is posting interesting things. I will follow. If it's empty, nothing is there, why would a person follow? Maybe your biography, your about, your tagline that you wrote is not enough. It's not going to be enough. You're going to want to show, have something to show for it, something that will entice people to actually follow. So We're not going to post five things right now, ten things right now. We're going to post one or two, and then we'll go on. But I want to show you this. I, I'll go back here to write another post, what's new. I'm going to show you that one cool thing that Google Plus has that the other networks don't have is the ability for you, when you write your text, to actually style it a little bit, to add bold or italics, not, not super super stylish like a, like a blog or whatever, but enough to stand out. Bold stands out. Italic stands out. So if you put in a little bit of bolder italics judiciously, you're going to stand out from people. You're going to stand out to people when, when it's a long home timeline. So the way you you do you do this text styling is with a little bit of code, not HTML code, much simpler than that. But let me show you here. Let's say I wanted to make the word bold. I wanted to make it bold. To make it bold you put the asterisk around any word or phrase. The asterisk is shift 8, that little star. That equals bold with um, asterisks. I'll just write it like this. You use asterisks to make something bold. It could be one word, one sentence, one paragraph. But be careful because if you make everything bold, everything stand out, then nothing stands out. You're not going to see it turn bold until you post. I won't post it yet. But the other kind of styling is italics. If you want italics, you use underscores. And again, you can put the styling around more than one word. Underscores will be italics. You won't see it until you post. But this is underscores. And there's a third one we can do, which is not very useful to most people, but there's still an option here. This one is called strike through. And that's a basic dash. Strike through. We'll see what it looks like in a moment. But you'll often use bold or italics. Those are the big ones. Strike through, you're going to see it's not that useful. And um, when I post, I'm going to post now, when I post, then they become bold, italics, strike through. And so with that little bit of extra styling, you'll stand out from the rest of the people that don't know that trick. Because there's no way that you would be able to do that normally. There's When I post something, there's nothing here that says bold or italics. Maybe they'll add it in the future. And now you know that if you add asterisks to your content, you can bold it. You add underscores to italicize. 
and dashes for strike through. So maybe, you know, if you've got some sort of legal content that you've written there and you're showing examples of how to further edit it, you can use strike through, I suppose. So if we're not going to go through the process of following yet, we want to post content to entice people to follow. And right now we're not reaching an audience. We're public, but we're not really reaching anyone. We're reaching, we're trying to reach everyone, therefore we're reaching no one. That's part of what you need to do when you're a beginner. You need to add content to then entice followers. Google Plus has added a, a feature that um, helps you also get discovered, which is called Collections. When we first logged into Google+, Plus, remember there was that grid that kind of looked like Pinterest. That's their version of Pinterest, kind of. Well, the way this works is if you click on Collections, it's going to perhaps tell you Featured Collections. Follow amazing stuff created by passionate people. Okay, let's go. So what this is, is people, such as Andrea posting about journeys into black and white, black and white photography. Karen posting about movie waters. Barry posting about aerial photography. Toby about modern, modern photography. Is that a word? Cycling, birds, trailers, any anything. So these people, these are regular people on Google Plus that are posting about this stuff. Uh, I'm interested, perhaps, on this feeling hungry. Oh, look at that! It was posted by the Marriott. The Marriott Hotel is on Google Plus. Mm -hmm. But what I'm going to do is, don't, don't click follow yet. I'm going to click the thumbnail, click the thumbnail of any collection, and then what happens is it's going to show you a lot of great stuff about that topic. And this shows that there are two million people following this collection. Because a person can follow the Marriott account or the Feeling Hungry collection. Because I might be posting, as a, as a pet shop, I might be posting stuff about cats and dogs and birds and lizards. But not everyone is going to love all those animals. The people that only want to see about cat posts could look at my collections and see I've got a cat collection. And they follow only the cat collection, not the dog one, not my main account. Marriott itself has 2,008,000 followers, but they have... 2,025,000. So they've got nearly 20,000 more followers of just this collection, not the whole account. And that's something that that is that, that can happen, and it's not a problem. It's just showing that there's a couple of ways to follow. Either the account, which will show you everything, or just a collection. So I bring this up because that's a lot of followers there paying attention. Let's see another one. Moody Moments. What is Winnie posting? these interesting moody pictures. She's got, uh, oh, she didn't put the statistic how many followers, but let's assume it's a few. I'm going to look at another one here. Luminous New Zealand. Okay, so Jonathan posting a bunch of photos of New Zealand. 31,000 followers. His own account has 22,000 followers. So he has more than 10,000 more followers just on that collection. So Google Plus is really pushing collections. So what I'm getting at is I'm gonna I'm gonna back up. I'm gonna go back. If you like any of these collections, you can click follow. I want that too. I want people to follow my collections. Your collections are found right here. If you back up to the collections screen, you will see these are featured. These are the ones you have followed, because you can unfollow them if you want. And these are yours, the collections that you have created. You can create as many as you want and put whatever you want into them. So this might be a more effective way. If you go to yours, create a collection. I'm going to create a collection. Gonna, these are like folders. I'm going to organize my posts. Instead of just putting them public, I'm going to put them into collections so that people that care about cat products will see this and follow. People that care about bird products will see this and follow. 
Google is really pushing collections. So I want that. I want that Google, uh, you know, hand up. And so if I click create a collection, give it a name, give it a tagline, and choose to make it public or share it with specific circles. But be careful. Once set, this can't be changed. If you set this visibility to only a specific circle, a specific group of people, you can never change it to be public. So only those people in that circle would be able to see it. This is Victor's tech. Let's say I'm going to create a collection called Mobile Gadgets. And the tagline, 80 characters to explain, and when someone searches to find me, I'm going to say amazing tiny mobile gadgets you need. You cannot use the bolding and italics trick here, unfortunately. That'd be nice. But that'll just show up as asterisks. I can click Create. I get a little bit of styling here. That's fine. I'll save it. I can make changes. Now I've got a collection. There's one follower, myself. And then I can add to the collection, there's the pencil. I can add a picture, I can add text, I can add links, I can add videos to this collection. And when people search mobile gadgets, they might find my collection, they might follow my collection, they might follow my account, and again, an audience. Followers. And so you can always further edit your collections. Notice you're going to see three dots oftentimes, either on a post or a collection or whatever. You can click the three dots, edit the collection. Uh, who has followed your collection? Did the collection get help? So I have used the go to this page again. So like, uh, so we add the credit. Yes, so if you want to change anything more about it, you can. This is all good here for the quick save. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To add something, you can click the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So collections are something that I would uh, recommend to explore. They will get you more, uh, potentially more traffic. We saw that when I created the collection, I could target the collection to, uh, to certain circles. I'm going to back up here to go back to collections. What I'm saying is that under yours, when you create a collection, you're saying, who would you like to, to see this? Public, my circles, only me, which would make it private, or custom. I could share this collection with only certain people or circles. Let's take a moment to talk about circles, which is a very powerful aspect of Google+. Plus, Because you can connect with as many people as you want, but it's highly recommended to organize those people. Therefore, when you post something, it'll go to the relevant people. So, notice on the left side menu, we have a button of people. Go ahead and click people. As you use Google Plus and post content and reply to people and such, you might get suggestions about who to connect with. That would be useful. Mine is empty, yours might have something, that's okay. But I've got no suggestions at the moment. Then at the top you've got following. I've made um, some connections. Um, I've got these built-in circles, following circle, customer circle, VIP, team members. These are built in. I clicked on follow on two accounts, so they go into the following 
circle. If you click If you click on, for example, following, it opens up to show you who's in that circle. We've got Jeffrey and Victor. The AP is empty and such. Let's say I wanted to create new circles. There's a button right there. I would recommend that you create circles. You can create as many as you want, but think about them in terms of how many people perhaps could go into them feasibly. So let's say I'm going to click new circle, name the circle. I've got this, um, this, this tech blog, but let's say the people that are really into mobile tech are a demographic. The people that are really into, uh, I don't know, Linux are another demographic. So I'm going to say I'm creating a circle called Linux for all the connections that I have that like Linux. Create. So now I've got a new Linux circle. I'm going to create another one for the people that are really into the Mac. Okay, Mac, the Mac circle. And then Windows. Because what we'll see is I can add people into these different circles. And when I post something, now I'll have the ability to share that post only to the Mac people, only to the Linux people. Or I can mix it and match it. I can select to share something to both Windows and Mac, both Linux and Windows. I can select more than one circle to share to. And we'll see that we can add a person, actually, to more than one circle. They can be in the, the Mac and the Linux circles at once. We can really customize it. The thing about creating circles that's useful is that you, you're, the people that you connect with won't know the name of the circle you put them into. They'll just get alert, an, a notification, an alert that says Victor's Tech followed you. It doesn't tell them what circle you put them in or anything. So you can name those anything. So create that circle of annoying people and put the annoying people in there. They'll never know. So I can put the annoying people in there, and they'll never know that they get that they keep getting that uh, post, or why they keep getting that post. You've made a connection with them, and they're getting your content. They don't know that they're part of the annoying people circle. So if I've got um, people in a certain circle, right now Jeffrey and Victor are both in the, in, in the, in the same circle of following. What I can do is I can click the word following, and I can do a couple of things. I can stop following them by turning off following, so then I'm no longer paying attention to their posts. And from the screen I can also add them to, for example, the Linux circle. Notice they're on two circles now. Let's say I only want him in the Linux circle. In a sense, you're still following them if you put him into the Linux circle. You're still following them. But the point of having the following circle is because when you post, there's that option for following. 
So you can leave them under following like the like the catch-all circle for everyone. And then you can further customize them and put them into certain other circles. So then it'll say that person is in two circles. So there's a lot to this. This is the advanced aspect of Google. There's a whole social network here. You claim a business, you set up a business, and then you start to build a presence on the network so that then when people search on Google Plus or a regular Google search, you could appear higher than your competitors, getting you traffic. And as I said earlier, popularity breeds popularity. So if you've got two followers, those two followers could help you get two more. Or 10 more. As you have 100 followers, those help you get more followers. So if you have zero followers, zero plus zero is zero, zero times zero is zero, so you're not going to get more followers unless you have followers. So we've talked about using the tactic of you following an account, you might get follow backs. You posting on collections, you might get follows that way. The last thing that we'll look at about getting followers is communities. There's another system over here, communities. I like this one more than collections. Maybe things will change and collections will overtake communities, but I think communities really are the more powerful one. The way communities work, if you click communities, again at the top you see recommended member yours. I have not become a member of any community yet. I have not created communities, but I have recommended communities. With collections, I say yes, create collections, use collections. With communities, don't create communities. Because then now you're going to be in charge of it. You're going to need to remove the spam. You're going to need to reply to people. You're going to need to calm down flame wars and kick people out of the community. You're going to need to moderate it and take care of it, or else it'll descend into chaos. So all of these communities that exist, there is at least one moderator, at least one person on Google Plus that manages it, kicks out the bad people, removes the bad pictures, takes out the spam. And the people that manage a community are not Google employees. They're not related to Google at all. These are regular people. Someone that was passionate enough and first enough to create the travel and photography community to get 91,000 members. Someone created this inspirational quotes community with over a million members and someone creates the community and they could add more managers to help them manage it but what I'm saying is don't create your own uh, not to put you down but you're probably not famous enough to manage a community you're not gonna attract enough people to have a vibrant community like this maybe you will I might be wrong but it's gonna be a lot of effort so I'm recommending for your business. Instead, go with recommended communities that are relevant to you. I've got this tech site. I'm not going to join the amazing places to visit community. What I post doesn't matter to that community. So if I'm looking around, um, maybe I will join this one. It looks like people are posting pro tips on Google+. I want to learn that. Photography, 2 million members. Maybe I would join that one because conceivably I could be sharing photography of my tech reviews. Create photos of my tech products. The point of any of these communities is once you join a community, then you have a captive audience. Right now I have zero followers. But if I join the nature photography community, now I can post and 2,227 people could see it. If I join the materials and manufacturing community, 2,000 people could see it. I currently have zero followers. But if I join some of these over here, street photographers, I could potentially reach 3,000 people. Could you have the same community name as someone else? You could. You could have the same name, but the, the, the algorithm of Google, the software of Google, will automatically show the ones with more popularity already. If you're trying to muscle in on someone else's name, 
it's, it won't quite work because there's already that name before you with already members, and so your community might not really be visible. So when do you suggest is the best time to start a community if you were going to do that? Once you've accumulated a good amount of followers, you know, 500 followers, 1,000 followers perhaps, because then you can start to tell those followers, hey, join me in this community. And then that way you start to build an audience there. Uh, you know, if you don't have very many followers, it's going to be very hard to entice, you know, early adopters to get into your community. Because Google will show communities, and if you search, communities will show up. But if I see a community that has seven followers, I'm not going to join it. Popularity means popularity. I'm going to try to first enlist my current followers to help boost those numbers to entice more people to join. Because if there's communities with very little members and activity, it's not very useful for me. So what you want to do then is join a, and then comment on their page, right? And, exactly. And um, leave your own post on their page. Exactly, because if I click uh, so I'm not going to click join yet, but I'm going to look at travel photography. If I click on the thumbnail to view it, like the collections, I'm going to see Neil posted something, Victor's there again, uh, Martina posted this, Gabriela, etc. So real people, regular people are posting to this community, and they are getting activity. They've targeted a community with a few thousand people, and they're getting activity. I want that. I want to post something here and get activity, but there's no button anywhere for me to post until I join. So joining unlocks it for me to be able to post my content to the relevant community and reach a big audience. So this um, thing here that they're doing, like no other social media offers that where you can actually post on someone else's page or community, right? There's variations of it. Pinterest has group boards, so um, they're not that that well known. But Pinterest has a way for you to have other people add to your to your pin board. This one I think is one of the most direct ways and powerful ways because when I do this for clients and we post on all the networks, oftentimes Google Plus is the best results because I'm targeting the posts to the right audience. Mm -hmm. You can't exactly do that on Twitter. The closest thing is hashtags. But hashtags is such an open field, you're going to get lost, perhaps. Pinterest has pin boards, but that requires a lot more effort to find open pin boards for you to post to. And Facebook has groups, but how many of you knew Facebook had groups? Raise your hands. Zero. No one knows Facebook has groups. Well, one person. How many of you use Facebook groups? No one. So, Facebook, they all have a variation of it, but I think Google Plus's version of it, communities, is the best. Um, yeah, it seems really smart because you can basically go on someone else's page and advertise in front of all their people free. Basically. Yeah. It's sort of like everyone everyone is in a certain meeting room. Everyone, you know, I walked into this room with all of these people and I'm going to start to talk about my thing and people will pay attention. Mm -hmm. As opposed to going to the street corner where everyone's talking about everything, no one's paying attention. That's the other networks. This one, I go to a location, someone's community, someone's page with a captive audience. So how many um, communities would you recommend posting to every day? As many as you can, but not so much as that it is, it is spam. Because if I have, I've just joined photography community, now I have the ability to post. So now the people here could see it. The, the thing that you have to be careful about, let's say I've got a great photo of a mountain, and I want to post it on this community, and I found three other communities, let's say. It might be spammy if I post the same picture to all those four communities. Because, as I said, these communities are run by people, not by Google. And each community has rules. They don't make it too prominent. You have to go look for them right here on this little info button. Someone created the community and created rules. A community might have a rule that says, do not cross post which means don't, po don't post the same thing you posted elsewhere to our community. We want to be exclusive. Some communities don't care. You can post the same thing to seven communities. They don't care. Some are very strict. They say post one thing per day, no cross-posting. Read the rules, because then the rules could be pretty strict, and you could get kicked out of the community. If you get kicked out of the community, you lose that audience. When you're creating a community, 
and you're creating your rules, is there like a page where you can actually kind of pick and choose what rules you want to apply, or do you have to just make them? No, you do make them yourself, but I would recommend look at communities that currently exist that you like, check what their rules are, and borrow and edit to your, to your specifications. So there's no built-in rules, but it's, it's really up to you. This one is pretty basic. It says, the community for those who roam the world with cameras. Exchange stories, get inspired, give and find advice. It says nothing about don't post 10 times. It doesn't say anything about don't post, don't cross post. It doesn't say anything about promote yourself, don't promote yourself. Some are strict. Some say don't promote yourself. Only post stuff for everyone. So when you're on um, doing Google Plus, how do you spend the majority of your time when you're on it? For companies that, that we would get hired for, the majority of the time that I spend on it would be that I, uh, I you might have to do it once, but it's a, it might be an ongoing thing, find communities. Spend the beginning to find communities that are relevant to the interests of this company. Once I've found 5, 10, 15, whatever, then after that part, the majority of the time then is going to the communities and trying to post at least one thing to each community that is not repetitive. So if I join 10 communities, does it mean I post 10 things? Ideally, yes, but that's a lot of work. So it's okay that I have one cool picture to share, and today, I'll share that one picture to this community, and tomorrow I'll share another picture to another community, or I could share to this community that picture, and on this other community I can share a variation of it. Maybe the picture's cropped with different text. Maybe it's a link back to my website to see the full-size picture. Just varying it. So the majority of the time is just figuring out what to post to each community. And oftentimes we've joined five to ten communities, so it's Let's look at what content we have, where can we share it? And then following up. Can they tell when you post the same photo over and over again? They could. Depending on the moderators of the community, they, you know, so there's some people that this is their day job to, to manage this stuff. Uh, and so they could see, okay, I'm looking at here, I'm, I'm going to look at Heike. I'm going to click her, hers, and I'm going to see what has she posted. Because you can look at everyone. Look at that. She's doing it. She posted something over here to Beauty of the Creator and Wonderful Pics, the exact same picture, twice right there. So if I was a, if I was a moderator that was very strict, I could have recourse to then say, well, cross-posting, delete it from the Wonderful Pics community. So that's how they can go. Not, not that it's automatic. Someone has to actually check what you're doing. And it should go without saying, but I'll say it, when you're posting to any of these communities, you should be posting your own stuff. Not some picture you found on Google that inspired you. Not uh, something borrowed from a website that you don't own. You should be posting your own original content. The search engines favor that much more, that it's your original content. So that's why it could be a lot of effort to manage social media. It's a full-time job. Social media marketers is a full-time job. So it's that effort to write that blog post, to take that photo, to edit that photo, to post the photo. But you should really be focusing on original content. There is some uh, usefulness of repurposed content, which simply means that, okay, that's a great photo. I want to click share. And I'm also then going to share it elsewhere. Notice I can share that over to my Twitter, Facebook, back to Google Plus, to another community. I could take this to share it to another community. Instead of public, I'm going to share it to the travel photography community, into the group of Asia. So that wasn't mine. I didn't shoot it. I can easily share it. Sharing is very easy on all the networks. But you should focus on your own original content. And you can use other people's content sparingly. If we say the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 your original stuff, 20% repurposed. 
You don't want to focus on just sharing other people's stuff because then what's the point of your account? You're, you're promoting everyone else's accounts. So 80% of the time or more, you're going to be posting your own stuff. And once in a while, I might find something that I like that is not mine that I will share to my followers or wherever. And that could help me get more followers. But I'm not going to rely on that. I'm not going to rely on someone else's amazing photo because it still will have the link back to the originator. And therefore, I'm losing traffic to that originator. Now, one question. Uh -huh. How do I know that, like, how many pages or what are those sites that, that I have joined in communities? You're going to see, if you, if you go to the main communities mm -hmm. um, screen, yeah. you're going to see then member. Okay. Under member, you'll see how many you've joined. You should be able to go back to profile and there should be an edit button. Um, yeah, okay. Edit profile. Oh, so the biggest secret that I can tell you about using Google Plus effectively are communities. The communities could be a double-edged sword, however because there could be strict moderators, there could be very strict rules. Um, someone might have had a bad day and you posted something that rubbed them the wrong way and they deleted it from the, from the community. Worst case scenario, you're kicked out of a community and then you no longer have access to those numbers of members. It has happened to me. I was a member of a community and I thought I was posting relevant stuff, but the guy in there, honestly, he was a jerk. He, was, he ruled the community with an iron fist. And I thought I was posting good things. People were commenting and liking it and such, but he didn't like it enough. And eventually, I posted too many of things he didn't like. He removed me from the community, and I lost access to like 200,000 people. There's nothing I can do about it. I complained to Google Plus themselves. There's a community here somewhere. It's called um, something about Google Plus. I think it's Google Plus Help, if you search at the top. Google Plus Help, I think. There's an official community from Google Plus, the Google Plus Help Forum. Notice that one is Ask to Join. So if you join like the official community and such. I, I went there, and then I took screenshots. And I said, everything that I've posted at this community, this moderator has deleted. Can you do something about it? And they replied and they said, the people that create the communities are in charge of them. We have no control over them. Unless, of course, it's you know illegal stuff and all of that. So follow the rules. Read the rules of the community. Follow along. You'll have access to those users. If you get kicked out of the community, you have very little recourse. You could perhaps contact the moderator directly and say, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. But again, if they're going to be a jerk moderator, they're going to be a jerk moderator. But it does work because, for example, not to show off, but let me show off here. If I show you my personal Google Plus account, I'll show you the business ones in a moment. Oops. On my personal, I use communities all the time. I post the stuff that I like, and I share it with people that like that stuff. And the result of that is that you know I have a few followers, and um, <laughs> and the statistic also is it might not be fully visible, but. Um, yeah, getting followers, I post my stuff, people like it, so, so the thing that I said, don't create communities, but I broke my own rule. I created a community called Tutorials, no one's joining it, because it, people don't quite join it sometimes. But uh, like this, I posted this truck full of old arcade games, and I posted it to the Retro Video Games community, and people loved it. 49 plus ones, three comments, two shares. This one here, I just posted a funny thing. This is my personal one, so it's just funny weird thing. Webster's New Encyclopedia of Dictionaries. So an encyclopedia of dictionaries. I thought that was funny. So I did five other people. So I'm posting stuff to the right community, 
that gets results for your business, that's very valuable because you're going to reach an audience that really cares really cares about your content. I was also going to show one more thing. The new, uh, there's also a statistic that you can see somewhere. Oh, right here. There's also a statistic. It's kind of buried sometimes. But there's also this other statistic. The number of views that your content gets. That's not a typo. Since the beginning of Google Plus, which is about 2012, I think, but I really post, I really focus, most of my posts are going off to communities. Once in a while I post something simply public and that gets some activity from like the 1,200 people that follow. But I'm parts of so many communities that I'm reaching many more people than those 1,200. Let's see my company profile. Post cool stuff. <laughs> So let's say my company profile, very similar thing here, 102 followers, 122,000 views. You know, the more you do it, the more, the more views you get. Views could get you followers, followers could get you traffic. This is getting you traffic as well. Views are getting you traffic. Someone saw that post, someone followed the link. So it's not just about getting followers, it's about views. And that's that whole art and science and magic of social media. In this class, we focused on Google+, Plus, Google Social Network. There's still much more we can learn about it, but in three and a half hours, this is enough we can get to. Um, I teach a couple of other classes. We're going to wind down the main lecture in a moment and have some lab time, but I want to mention a couple of other classes you might be interested in, and then we'll take questions and such. The printed catalog of classes is useful, but it goes out of date. What I would recommend instead is check our classes on our website, sdce.edu, San Diego Continuing Education.edu, and you have Take a Class. Take a class and you can search by keyword. So if you're looking for WordPress classes, search WordPress. If you're looking for social media, search social media. If you're looking for particular instructors, search their name. So if I search for my name, Campo, C A M P O S, it's going to show you here the 20 classes I'm teaching this semester. And you can then organize it by start date. You can't do that on the printed catalog. When you put it by start date, you'll see the classes that have passed and that will come. So in this part, in this point in the semester, I've already taught a lot of classes, all of these classes here. And these are currently going on. Mondays, I'm teaching a WordPress class. It's part two, so you'll be pretty lost if you come into it. Wait for part one, it's going to come up again later. On Tuesdays, I'm teaching social media for your business, part one. I'm covering in that class Google+, Twitter, Facebook. Then there's also a part two. It's kind of weird. December's weird because they've put part one and part two as the same month. Usually part one is one month, part two is the next month. But it's okay for you to take either or. It's okay for you to come to part two without part one. In this case, not WordPress, you need part one. But part two of the class is going to be uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm going to talk about those networks. In that class is Fridays, 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Part one is Tuesday nights, 6 p.m. to 9.30. You can still come in. You missed a day, but you can still come in. We talked about Google+, Plus, so it might be a little redundant. Um, Today, Wednesdays, we're doing Advanced Google, and as I said, next week we're going to talk about Google Analytics, Google Webmaster Tools, so bring your login password for your website if you want to set that up completely. And then Wednesday nights, 6 p.m. to 9.30, I'm doing Search Engine Optimization. So that is a big topic, and almost all of these other topics that I talk about still relate back to SEO. SEO is Search Engine Optimization, getting your website found getting traffic to your website, or your app, or your resume, whatever you're trying to do online, your business. And part of SEO is social media. I teach a couple of classes there. Part of SEO is blogging. I keep, teach a blogging class, not this month, but other times. Part of SEO is knowing the advanced features of Google. That's this class. 
So all of these things relate. And then there we talk about a marketing plan and a company profile and keyword research and all of that stuff. So all of these classes together would be a huge class that you would be here Monday through Friday. Sure, like, you know. It is? The word marketing is SEO. Sorry. I was um, skeptical about attending that because I don't use WordPress, but you're saying that it doesn't matter if you use WordPress. Like exactly. Because we're going to be talking about keyword research. It doesn't matter what kind of website software you have. You need to develop your keyword strategy. You need to develop your marketing strategy, your company profile. So you don't need that specific software. Any software will work. You need some kind of website online presence. This still applies for anything. And then the month ends, and then next month in January is another weird month um, because of just the shortness of it. But I'm offering again the SEO class in January. That's Wednesday noon, or uh, also Thursday nights, and then Advanced Google again, and then Social Media Part 1. So I'm offering a bunch of classes throughout the year. You're welcome to take as many as you want. They're all free as many times as you want. This stuff changes. The social media stuff changes, the SEO changes. You might have taken my class a year ago. Take it again, it probably changed. It keeps me employed. So these are the classes that are going on. Any questions about those? Could you print that? I'll let you print it because the printer's off. And it's also on our catalog. But um, as soon as I'm done with the lecture and, and, the, and we're on the lab, we can print it. Um, so any general questions about what we learned today or what we're going to do next time? Okay, so hopefully you use your you use your Google Plus at home before you come back. You want to go home, log into the address, remember, plus.google.com. You're going to log in. I forgot to mention, but when you log in, then you want to remember to switch the account because when you log in, it's automatically going to be in your personal profile. You want to click your icon and switch to your business and then pick up where, you, where we left off here. And there's no homework in this class, there's no grades, there's no certificate, none of that. It's what you get out of it, what you learn and what you apply. So there's no homework. But your homework is for you to uh, log in and try to use Google Plus a little bit before now, before next time. And maybe even on mobile. Download the free app, check out Google Plus on mobile. What's useful about that is that you can take a photo right away and upload it. Whereas here you have to do the extra steps of find the photo and all of that. What's also useful on mobile is you can search locally. Right here I've got a search box at the top, but that might not target locally very well. If you're on mobile, you can search, you can choose to look at what's local around. What are people posting about in San Diego and such? So that's it for the moment. We'll do a little lab time until 4. I do need to wrap it up at 4 on the dot because I've got to get on the freeway back down south. If you need any help from now until 4, call me over. And we'll do it again next week.